broadcast was live. There you go. I'm not sure if anyone's joined yet, but if you have, we're going to start officially at about 7.05, so feel free to uh, drop any questions or comments or, or information that you'd like. Oh, okay. Well, I see uh, some people are starting to join. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? I like your uh, Nurses Week uh, pin on your your name. My wife's a nurse, so um, that's that's great. Lots of uh, great work the nurses have done over the past couple of years. So if you're just joining now, we're going to start in uh, a couple minutes. Uh, we'll start at about 7.05. Uh, but feel free to drop uh, chat items in as you're coming on. Oh, there's Chris from London. Welcome. I see your photo you have from Nineveh. That's, that's pretty interesting. Seems like you, you've traveled our country fairly well. Welcome, Chris. We're still uh, a couple more minutes here. We're just going to wait till about 7.05 to uh, do our welcome and uh, move forward uh, with the presentation. So throughout the presentation, feel free to drop any comments or questions you have in the in the chat, and we're happy to to review them and uh, take them up uh, when uh, when Steve's done his uh, discussion. So uh, as ideas or concepts are popping into your head, don't feel don't hesitate to to uh, to ask. All right, so it's uh, seven o five. So I'm going to provide a, a quick uh, introduction. So thank you very much uh, for joining uh, this evening. I know it's uh, a beautiful evening out there, one of the first of many in the forecast. So um, so thanks for uh, say, uh, tuning in on your on your screen. 
Um, so my, my name is Patrick Darby. I am the co-chair of Sist uh, uh, Smart Energy Oxford uh, here in Oxford County. Uh, we have a goal of 100% renewable energy uh, within Oxford County that we committed to uh, about five or six years ago. 100% uh, renewable energy is a very ambitious goal. Uh, we were the only second. We were the second municipality in Canada to make such an ambitious goal at the time. Uh, so we were definitely uh, we've been recognized as leaders um, within uh, the municipalities across Canada. Uh, ultimately, what it means to to be 100% renewable energy is we need to offset every unit of energy that we consume within uh, within the county of Oxford. So certainly, a very significant uh, effort needs to be. Uh, taken by by the entire community to achieve that uh, kind of our overarching um, methods to achieve that are, are focused on conservation first as our, our number one priority uh, so that's taking the the load the energy loads we have within our county and reducing those as much as possible through uh, conservation programs um, so an example of that would be upgrading your building envelope or uh, adding smarter controls on your systems you ever you already have operating. The second priority is to consider more energy efficient and low carbon uh, systems. So that's considering um, you know transition from a natural gas fired furnace to maybe an integrated hybrid uh, heat pump with natural gas backup for your home uh, retrofit, which uh, has energy efficiency gains and uses energy sources which are have a lower carbon uh, impact as a whole and then our final uh, line of defense is to offset all of the energy that we've reduced uh, with renewable sources so uh, with that that's a very high level uh, of uh, understanding of our 100 percent renewable energy goal uh, so i'll flip it over to dennis to provide a bit of a bit of background on future oxford Patrick, and for those of you joining us tonight, thanks for tuning in. Future Oxford is excited to be co-hosting tonight's speaker series with the Oxford County Libraries and the Smart Energy Oxford team. For those of you who may be tuning in from the recording of tonight's broadcast in the future, because we will post this after tonight, we're glad you have a chance to check it out as well. You're exactly why we posted it on the website. My name is Dennis Guy, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the Future Oxford Partnership, which is a group of passionate champions that believes not only in the vision of an Oxford where economies, communities, and environments thrive together, but also in the Oxford of today, which in many cases already has communities, economies, and environments that are thriving together. I recently heard someone say when you're referring to community sustainability that it's who we are and it really resonates with me. So I'm not going to take up too much of your time from our guest speaker this evening, but I want to draw a quick line of sight to connect the dots between tonight's event and future Oxford. About five to six years ago, a group of determined people, um, or they determined that Oxford could benefit from a county-wide look at community sustainability. So a bunch of individuals, organizations, businesses, and governments came together to determine what is most important to maintaining a high quality of life and to create an inspiring vision for anyone and everyone to aim for. So the result is the future Oxford Community Sustainability Plan, released in 2015 which is structured into three pillars, community, economy, and environment. The plan documents 70 key actions to build upon the sustainable practices we already have, of which since we started, 94% has seen progress made by a broad range of community stakeholders. And the actions continue to see progress today. So throughout the, five, uh, the past five years, Future Oxford has coordinated and or participated in a number of initiatives including what was once an in-person version of the speaker series, hosted at various libraries throughout the county, <clears throat> showcasing things like local entrepreneurs with sustainable business practice, uh, inviting residents to learn about energy efficient buildings, and we even hosted a workshop on electric and hybrid vehicles. Last fall, we brought the speaker series back to life in a virtual format, <clears throat> and we showcased some well-regarded waste innovators in Oxford, uh, such as Danielle from Welcome to Body Care, Tom Butler, who's a local high school teacher and farmer, and tonight we continue our journey, uh, making a stop to focus on hydrogen energy. So with that, I'll turn it back to Patrick and we can get into tonight's conversation. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. Um, so this is a very exciting uh, topic uh, for discussion here uh, uh, with hybrid. Uh, hybrid, sorry, hydrogen. Hydrogen is a is a very interesting consideration for uh, the future of of energy and uh, throughout uh, Canada and more broadly uh, across the globe. Um, so we're excited to have Steve Kay uh, join us for, for a presentation. Uh, Steve Kay is a professional engineer um, that has worked for <coughs> Union Gas in Enbridge for almost 30 years. Uh, he's held numerous positions with uh, Enbridge and Union Gas, and he's currently a manager of business development. Um, uh, Steve is uh, in leading a role uh, with, with Enbridge, developing low carbon solutions, including hydrogen, compressed natural gas, and liquefied natural gas uh, business lines. Uh, he's been a guest speaker at uh, numerous hydrogen and natural gas vehicle industry events, and is a previous member with uh, CSA, the Canadian Standards Association, and currently is a sitting member of the board for the Canadian Natural Gas Vehicle Alliance and the Canadian Urban Transit uh, Research and Innovation Consortium. Uh, Steve lives in Chatham, Ontario, uh, has, has three children, and also is a volunteer with the YMCA of Southwestern Ontario as a vice chair of the board. So thank you very much, Steve, for joining us on this uh, very interesting uh, topic of conversation. Oh, thanks for the introduction. It's uh, it's great to be here. Um, coming to you from just just south of Chatham, Ontario, on the shores of Lake Erie, and it's a uh, it's a beautiful night here at my cottage, and I'm excited to be able to talk to you here tonight about what's a very exciting topic. Um, hydrogen has got a lot of attention lately, um, <clears throat> but it's going to be a little bit tough to do justice to this. And I think I have just about ten minutes, so I'm going to stay fairly high level here, um, but we'll be happy to take any detailed questions you have <clears throat> at the Q&A we've got planned for the, uh, for the end of the discussion. Um, if you could move to the next slide for me, please, that'd be great. So you'll have to forgive me here, but I, I'm, I'm going to open with a shameless plug for, for Enbridge. Um, this picture you see here is uh, it's of our hydrogen electrolyzer plant in Markham, Ontario. Um, it's a 2.5 megawatt facility, and it's been running for a few years now, and it has capacity to produce up to 1,000 kilograms per day of hydrogen. Uh, it takes a little from the Ontario grid and uses electrolysis to split water, basically, to produce hydrogen and oxygen. It was the largest of its kind when we first built it, um, and later this year will also be the first gas utility in North America to blend hydrogen into our natural gas distribution system. And that, that hydrogen will be delivered from this plant you see in the picture to approximately 3,600 residential and commercial customers that we have in the Markham area. You can find a lot, if you're interested in more detail on that, you can find uh, there's a full application on the Ontario Energy Board website that we made uh, to receive approval for, for that project. If you could switch to the next slide for me, please. So I thought I'd briefly take everyone back to high school chemistry, basically. Um, there's some unique things about hydrogen. It's, it's the first element on the periodic table because it's the simplest and lightest element on Earth, approximately 14 times lighter than air. It's also the most abundant element in the universe and accounts for about 75% of all mass in the universe. In its natural and gaseous state, it's, in, it's invisible, it's odorless, tasteless, and non-toxic, toxic, making it very difficult to detect. And like electricity, it's an energy carrier and transports usable energy created elsewhere to another location. It has the highest energy per mass of any fuel. And by way of example, a, a kilogram of hydrogen is the same energy as, a, as about 2.8 kilograms of gasoline. However, the, the flip side to that is hydrogen has a really low volumetric energy density, 
which which when you try to distribute and store it, it makes it quite a challenge. Now it's also its ability to produce electricity with just water as a byproduct makes it a very desirable alternative fuel. Um, Hydrogen is also clean burning when it's combusted with water as a byproduct. Um, even though hydrogen is abundant in the universe, it's it's also strangely not found in its natural state on Earth commonly, and it's more commonly bonded um, to other sources like water as the uh, as the H two and H two O and uh, and methane, uh, which is natural gas, common you know with the chemical uh, symbol of CH four. Um, the two main methods, electrolysis and steam methane reforming, or what we call SMR, are the common methods used to extract the hydrogen gas from, from water in the case of uh, electrolysis and from methane in the case of uh, steam methane re reformation. If you could switch to the next slide for, for me. So hydrogen is very versatile, as I mentioned, and it's quite a unique energy carrier. It, it, it really can enable economic, it, you know, as a compressed gas or in liquid form, it has, as I mentioned earlier, the highest energy per mass of any fuel, any common fuel. And that really allows it to transfer large amounts of energy from the point where it's produced um, to various end use applications. Um, it can be produced from clean energy sources, and it's carbon and pollutant free at its point of use when, when used in a fuel cell. It's also suitable for um, energy intense applications where uh, electrification is challenging or, or limited in hydrogen, uh, including their safety considerations, their ability to be transported over long distances via pipeline or via road. In, uh, in trailers, and it has great versatility as an energy carrier, which, which makes it um, an alternative to natural gas, really, in a range of different applications. Hydrogen's use as a fuel for um, uh, fuel cell electric vehicles is also becoming a really attractive zero emission alternative for transportation, especially in heavy duty vehicles and transit buses, which need um, really energy dense fuel. Um, it's used as a fuel for power generation, which allows you uh, to do load management and uh, energy storage as well. And that really helps enable the growth of variable renewable power like wind and solar. Uh, it can be burned directly or as a blend with natural gas to reduce carbon emissions for uh, building heat uh, and also for high grade heat for various industries. It's, it's commonly used um, as a feedstock for industrial processes like petroleum refining, bit, bitumen upgrading, ammonia production, methanol production, and, and steel production as well. Just switch to the next slide, please. So in terms of um, sort of the value chain, it, it, it can really be made from a variety of feedstocks, uh, including water and electricity. Um, fossil fuels, including natural gas and crude oil, biomass, and it's also often can be a byproduct from industrial processes. We're lucky here in Canada to have access to low cost hydrocarbon resources and abundant clean electricity from sources, from hydroelectricity, from nuclear, from and from wind and solar. Um, hydrogen can be stored and transported from the point of production to point of use in a number of ways. And, and really this part of the value chain has significant economic and emissions implications, which affect the overall hydrogen delivered cost and as well as the greenhouse gas life cycle emissions. It's low volume energy, energy volumetric energy dens density that I mentioned earlier makes it storing it a challenge, both as a bulk commodity at the point of production and in end uses like fuel storage on board vehicles. It also makes transportation over the road in bulk via trailers quite expensive. Transporting hydrogen in underground pipelines is more cost effective, although it's significantly more costly than trans transporting natural gas due to, um, again, back to that volumetric energy density consideration. 
In terms of end use, the adoption of high Hydrogen will, will probably be focused on energy intensive applications where it offers advantages over other low carbon options. Um, you know, that includes things um, you know, like fuel for long range transportation, power generation, heat for industry and buildings, and feedstock for heavy industrial processing like steel and cement making. Uh, flip to the next slide, please. So the, the various ways hydrogen is produced from input feedstocks to output bulk gases, they're kind of known as the production pathways. And in evaluating hydrogen production pathways together and relative to other energy carriers, that the conversion efficiency, carbon intensity, feedstock availability, cost, and storage, and distribution impacts all need to be considered. And we often use colors to represent the different hydrogen production pathways with gray hydrogen being produced by uh, steam methane reformation without carbon capture and sequestration or CCS. Um, that's, um, it, we have quite an established production and supply chains, primarily in Alberta for fuel refining and fertilizer production. Over time, we kind of hope that will shift to lower carbon intensive pathways. Blue hydrogen is, is also produced by SMR, but it includes carbon capture and sequestration. Now we're the fourth largest global natural gas producer in Canada. So there's a significant opportunity to drive that pathway forward. Um, Alberta's Quest project, you may have heard of, it's been in operation since 2015 and it's got over a, a million tons per year of CO2 from, from an SMR plant injected and stored more than two kilometers underground. Can, you know, Canadian companies are also continuing to R&D on the production of, of blue hydrogen from oil reservoirs as well. And then green hydrogen is, is produced from water by electrolysis using renewable electricity like hydroelectricity, wind or solar. And that's the type of the facility that we currently own and operate in Markham, Ontario that I showed you on that opening slide. That This particular pathway is very reliant on the cost and car. And then the last one here is a nuclear hydrogen. It's, it's very similar to green hydrogen with the, uh, in, in that it's produced by electrolysis with the main difference being the source uh, of the electricity. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, the, the future is, uh, is really bright for hydrogen, especially here in Canada. Um, we, uh, you know, our, our electricity grid is relatively clean and we have abundant natural gas supplies, you know, with world leading hydrogen industry expertise uh, in the country as well with the likes of Ballard and Hydrogenics and others. Um, the, both the federal and provincial government here in Ontario are, have recognized the need for a cohesive strategy to help overcome the challenges. Um, driving down costs will be the key for it to gain broader traction in the market though. And, you know, a few of the key elements to achieving those cost reductions are things like, you know, building large scale facilities uh, that are located near the demand hubs. And that's really two things you achieve. You, you get better economies of scale with bigger facilities and it minimizes transportation uh, costs between the, uh, the supply and the, uh, and the demand. Another is access to low cost and clean electricity. And that just electricity ends up being the most significant input cost to producing hydrogen by electrolysis. So it's really critical that you have cheap electricity, which is common in some provinces and less common in, in other provinces. And then another big thing is high load factor operations. So you want this, if you're gonna expend a bunch of capital to build these facilities, you want them to be running 24 seven basically to make best use of the capital investments. And you want supply equal demand as well. And then the other, the fourth thing would be technology and efficiency improvements that are bound to come over time. Um, next slide, please. So on the distribution side, we, we have, again, we have some significant advantages in the storage and distribution of hydrogen. It, we, you know, we already have some dedicated hydrogen pipelines in a few regions, and we have extensional and extensive natural gas pipeline network. And we can leverage that to both store and transport hydrogen through that system. We also have excellent geological reserves that, that can be used to store hydrogen. 
um, under the ground and our two coasts uh, on the east and west position us well for uh, international export of, of produced hydrogen. And, and the most significant issue though is, is really the current high cost of transportation, whether that be by pipeline, rail, ship, or over the road in, in high pressure tube trailers. You know, the, and it's back to this low volumetric energy density. It, it just, it really makes it much higher in cost to transport and store relative to other fuels. And that can really increase the delivered cost to end users. So the other considerations that there's some unique qualities of hydrogen and, and that means it requires careful evaluation of the blending levels into existing natural gas pipelines. You know, typically we look to limit that to under 20%. Uh, by volume, and that really limits the amount of hydrogen you can inject into the systems, especially in the summer months when the traditional gas markets are not as high and demand is low. But overall, the key to success in all of this will be, you know, broad collaboration and cooperation across government, industry, and end users to, to really get large-scale projects built and operating so that we can demonstrate, you know, the multiple production paths, the distribution storage, and the various end-use markets. And really around the world, the rest of the world's moving very, moving forward very aggressively if you've been following the news with massive hydrogen investments. And it's, it's really important that we, we not left, be left behind. So, you know, we, need, we, we really need to get moving on this. So with that, I think I've probably used up my 10 minutes, I'm guessing. I'll, uh, maybe the next slide is Q&A if we want to switch over to that. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation, Steve. Uh, I think that was a lot of great information. So uh, we'll flip over to a few questions here. We'll spend about uh, 10 minutes just to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, try to wrap up by 7.35 over to Dennis in a couple of minutes on, on his side. So lots of questions in, lots from Brian Smith in particular. So thanks, Brian. Uh, first question uh, regarding um, you know the automotive industry. So just in general, maybe you can answer this question on the today's state and maybe projecting about 10 years out uh, with the availability of hydrogen fueling stations. And uh, will we need to have range anxiety uh, when we consider uh, hydrogen powered uh, vehicles? Uh, great, great question. Yeah, in terms of, in ter I think there's a couple parts of that. One was the fueling station status and um, and then range, I think, if I picked that up correctly. Um, fueling stations, extremely limited, unfortunately. There's, um, there's a few in uh, BC. Um, they're more prevalent in the states in California, but uh, certainly here in Ontario, it's very, very limited. Um, you know, one of the issues with fueling is you not only need to produce the fuel uh, through electrolysis or some other method, but then you also need to compress it up to quite a high pressure in order to store it on board the vehicle. So you need you need both elements. So for example, our, our facility in Markham, Ontario that we have is producing hydrogen, um, green hydrogen, but it's, it's producing it at 400 pounds per square inch for PSI. And in order to fill vehicle tanks, we need to add compression there to be able to get it up to, you know, 3,600 to 5,000 psi. So, uh, so unfortunately, the infrastructure is not. There's not a lot of it right now. Um, I think the um, that will grow in time. We have plans to um, to develop uh, a station at our facility in Markham, and I know there are other companies that are looking to to build as well. On the transportation market, probably the leading market right now is the transit market. Transit buses are fairly well established. There's somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 of them, I believe, around the world operating. Um, and so, uh, you know, those those facilities, yeah, I think we'll see those moving much faster than, than the other transportation markets. In terms of range, uh, um, yeah, one of the things that hydrogen does provide relative to battery electric is a significant bump in range. Um, I know that um, in the transit bus example, um, we're able to store enough fuel on board the transit bus so that it can 
you know, fully complete its day's operations without any need to come back to the facility for a recharge like you would in battery electric, for example. So there's definitely an ability to extend range beyond what you would get out of battery electric deployments. Hopefully that okay. answered the question. Yeah, very good. Uh, thank you for the comprehensive answer. The next question here is on uh, economics. Um, so if elect electrolysis is, is required to produce hydrogen, uh, what does the energy efficiency, uh, carbon savings, and uh, utility cost savings look like in comparison to uh, other low carbon uh, sources of energy like the, the electricity grid, as an example? Yeah, um, great question. Um, so the 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 basis for um, the question, I believe, is an electrolysis solution. So if we think of that, then ideally what we're looking for there is a very clean grid as the supply input to the um, to the process. And, uh, you know, Ontario's is, I think we're 95, 96% um, non-carbon based and Quebec, it's quite strong as well. You'd, so you'd want to start with that um, from an input cost perspective that's your and carbon perspective that's your real key source there um, just in terms of pricing um, it's 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 fairly expensive um, kind of a rule of thumb that I generally use with with pricing um, and there's a whole bunch of different units that people talk about so it's I'll try to I'll try to jump between units to make it make sense but roughly speaking for electrolysis the process in terms of efficiency it takes about um, 50 kilowatt hours to produce a kilogram of hydrogen okay so um so if you think about that's the input electricity 50 kilowatts to produce a kilogram so if you think of let's say it's 10 cents a kilogram uh, 10 cents a kilowatt hour is your electricity price just to make the math easy then you're looking at five dollars a kilogram to produce um through electrolysis and that's just for the ele electricity cost it doesn't include capital cost to build the facilities and any other maintenance and so forth but electricity is the biggest input cost so you're at five dollars a kilogram just to put a kilogram of hydrogen is roughly equal to a gallon of gasoline in terms of its energy sort of capability so you know five dollars for a kilogram works out to about a dollar 32 uh a liter for gasoline on an equivalent basis so that sort of gives you a bit of a feel and that just for reference sake um in a home heating type application you know the gas that you're the natural gas you're using at your house to heat your house you know, on an equivalency basis to gasoline you're, you're talking somewhere around you know 25 cents a, a gasoline liter equivalent for the cost of natural gas so the, the key message here is that you want hydrogen to be displacing the more expensive fuels, ideally. Um, and those tend to be in the transportation sector where you're, you know, you're dealing with diesel and, and gasoline and other liquid fuels. Ho hopefully that helped with the question. Yeah, I think it did. Uh, Dave, David Mayberry had a similar question and I think that responded to it. And it sounds like, uh, you know, to become readily available for all applications within the Ontario market, um, you know, more develop development is going to be necessary um, to start to hit that inflection point compared to typical uh, sources of energy. Um, we had another interesting question here, and, and I think it's relevant given the uh, ge geography of, uh, of Ontario and Canada. Um, what are the impacts uh, within cold weather environments? So let's think of our northern communities. And the reference point was was Timmins and above, um, in using hydrogen or producing it. Yeah, it's it's all about the design of the uh, of the vehicles and the type of fuel cell that's being used. The hydrogen itself can be produced in cold weather. It's it's that's not a. I mean, we've run our our electrolysis plant. Only had minus twenty five. You know weather so the production of hydrogen itself is okay um 
if the question is more around vehicle use and fuel cells and their ability to handle cold weather, that's, I'm not a fuel cell expert myself, but I understand that, you know, the buses that are being, um, for example, the city of Winnipeg has explored uh, and is exploring a fuel cell buses for their fleet. And I mean, it's obviously quite cold up there. And I know there are other cities, Mississauga, for example, looking at fuel cell buses um, here as well in Ontario. And so um, it's all about the design of the bus and the, and the fuel cell being used and so forth to ensure it can operate in cold weather. But that is that can be done. Very good. Uh, so we'll do one more question here uh, and then and then wrap up. So so our last question will we'll put uh, put over to Steve here is regarding uh, materials. So in particular, uh, cement and, and concrete. So do you have, do you have any uh, understanding of the current uh, percentage of uh, production of cement, which is sourced through hydrogen and any ideas on the pace of conversion from, from coal to hydrogen in, in these industries? Yeah, unfortunately, don't have a lot of deep experience with those industries. I, I wish I did. I, I def we are definitely exploring discussions with the, and interested in speaking with those interest in, with those industries to try to find, you know, good end use markets to 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 um, develop. I think I mentioned in one of my earlier slides that, you know, a collaboration between industry end users and government. moving and so unfortunately i don't have i apologize that i don't have a great deal of experience with that i could probably follow up and get an answer for that but i'm not currently hydrogen use from green source it's like canadian tire for example uses at one of their warehouses they have fuel cell forklifts and they're generating um hydrogen from the Ontario grid and using it to fuel their forklifts but it's it's very the green hydrogen applications are very limited right now very good thank you Steve well I think it's a relevant uh, discussion uh, in particular when we're talking about the embodied carbon associated with the products we use throughout uh, the various industries uh, in Ontario and Canada so with that, uh, I want to thank Steve for his uh, his presentation and Q and A. I think it was very informative and a very relevant topic to how we're transitioning uh, both locally here in Oxford County, throughout Ontario and across Canada uh, from a carbon reduction standpoint. So thank you very much, Steve, for for your presentation and Q and A. I'll flip it over to Dennis. Well, I guess I'm the only thing keeping you uh, from the rest of the evening. So I'll be brief. I just, on behalf of the Feed for Oxford Partnership, want to thank those who helped make tonight a reality uh, behind the scenes. Don and Thomasina created all the promotional materials and got the word out. So thanks to them. Sarah at the library is always eager to lend a hand and partner with us. So thank you, Sarah. Uh, all of our Smart Energy Oxford members uh, for sitting down and brainstorming some ideas for tonight, and especially Alan Sutton for getting us through to Steve. And of course, our, our MC, Patrick, uh, great to have him here tonight and uh, ask a lot of these questions of Steve. And then lastly, Steve, yourself, for taking the time to share your knowledge of the hydrogen industry with us. Uh, really thanks to you and thanks to Embridge as well. So thanks for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening.